Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and good afternoon and good evening to our friends overseas and in particular our friends coming in from China. My name is John Allen, and I'm the president of the Brookings Institution, and it is a great pleasure uh, to welcome you all today to our event at Brookings, which is how we rebuild a conversation with President Jin Li Chin uh, on the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank's fifth anniversary. We're deeply honored to have you with us this morning, President Chen. Uh, and I know that as you began your second five years as the president, you remain a, a crucial leader in upholding the AIIB's serious organization uh, on the world stage today. Prior to your current position, uh, President Chen had a long and storied history in both the public and the private sectors. Of his many accomplishments, President Chen served as the chairman of the China International Capital Corporation, one of the world's largest investment banks, the chair of the supervisory board of the China Investment Corporation, and the chair of the International Forum of Sovereign Wealth Funds. While the AIIB is, was created only five years ago due to President Chen's leadership and experience, the organization has grown to over a hundred member countries. And indeed through its mission of helping quote, build infrastructure for tomorrow, also known as I4T. The AIB seeks to raise the quality of infrastructure, mobilize private finance and invest in technology to trigger not only growth, but also to set the world on a greener, more inclusive path. And especially on the latter point, as the world slowly comes to grips, grips with the impending uh, climate crisis, it will take all of us, not just to create a more sustainable future, but one that averts a genuine climate disaster in the years ahead. Of course, like so many organizations, Brookings included, AIIB has faced a unique set of challenges this past year as the COVID-19 pandemic continues to devastate lives and livelihoods worldwide. It's a topic central to just about any discussion that anyone could have today. And, and it's one that we'll discuss shortly uh, during the interview. At the same time, with the inauguration just two days ago of President Joseph Biden, AIIB will see a different type of US and American leadership, one focused on returning to familiar tenets of multilateralism and shared values, as well as rising challenges that will take the form of climate change and economic recovery and, and new and emerging technologies. And so it is a significant moment for both the world and for AIIB one filled with challenges, but also filled with profound opportunities. And President Chen, we are all eager to see what your role and your organization will play in the years to come in dealing with these many challenges. So with that, before we move on, uh, I wanna remind our audience today that we're live, but we're also recording. And President Chen, welcome, sir. We're so grateful for your time today. And please, if you have remarks, we'd be very interested in hearing them, sir. Thank you. Thank you, President Allen. A very good morning to all of you. Please allow me to express my appreciation to President Jiang Allen and his team for graciously hosting this event. When we last met, the world was a very different place, and so was the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Over the course of five years, much has happened, not least the most recent unforeseen devastation caused by the pandemic a global health crisis that has taken so many lives, disrupted the global production chain, and put many economies in jeopardy. The reality is that global recovery is likely to be slow, arduous, and uneven. AIB marks the fifth anniversary against this backdrop of uncertainty, yet we remain resilient. As we take stock of the past five years of operations, we ask ourselves, what kind of world we should be rebuilding and what role should AIB play in creating that vision. Over the course of the last five years, we have undertaken deep shareholder engagement and an analysis of macroeconomic shifts in Asia. Through this work, we have identified five key trends which we believe will be important drivers of the recovery in the coming years. Given that we subscribe to the idea 
that a sustainability and investing in sustainable infrastructure is the key to our future resilience. The first trend we've identified makes it clear that healthcare is the weakest link in a global economy. Greater and more strategic investments in the health sector are needed if we are to safeguard ourselves against the next pandemic. Fortunately, policymakers and leading thinkers are met are recognizing this urgent need and are responding to it. A healthy nation is a productive nation. It's critical for multilateral development banks and our stakeholders to plan and invest in our most important resource, people. While AIB will remain committed to investing in core infrastructure, we intend to gradually expand our capacity role and value added in social infrastructure to meet this demand. The second trend is enhanced investment in climate change mitigation. This also calls for financing for the transition to carbon neutrality. What is critical is phasing out fossil fuel and phasing in renewable energy to ensure that growth and livelihoods will not be adversely affected throughout the entire process. It's quite fine to see global efforts toward this direction. Indeed, there is global momentum in investments in green infrastructure. But the actual volume of investment is still well below desired targets. For our part, AIB has set an ambitious target of ensuring that 50% of our approved financing by 2025 will be directed toward climate finance. It is important to point out that efforts to strengthen our health systems and address climate change can no longer be dealt with in silos. They are inextricably linked. We need to probe the intricate emerging, emerging pattern of the relationship between climate and health outcomes. Rebuilding the global economy will require that we no longer tackle challenges in isolation we will have to explore a new development paradigm that is environment smart and ecosystem smart. The third trend is the heightened awareness and use of technology as a result of COVID-19. In fact, digital related sectors have been the biggest winners of the pandemic. The health crisis has changed the way we work, study and live. As a young multilateral development bank, located in Asia, a region that embraces and is at the forefront of technological innovation, we are well positioned to seize the opportunity to invest in infrastructure that capitalizes on the latest developments in infrastructure, infratech. In an increasingly interdependent world, digital connectivity can boost our efficiency. If we do not fully embrace this irreversible trend, and if we are content to remain in our comfort zone and have no interest in navigating uncharted waters, we run the risk of losing our bearings in the not too distant future. New technologies can also level the playing field for low income countries, enabling them to leapfrog on their development journey. It comes as no surprise that public budgets are struggling to recover from the economic shock of COVID-19. Policymakers facing tough choices are forced to delay critical infrastructure investments as they focus on health crisis. As the immediate health impacts of COVID-19 eventually recede, countries will have to deal with deep economic scarring from the pandemic including widespread bankruptcies, increased unemployment, and high debt levels. Long-term investors would undoubtedly seek safe entry points into the infrastructure investments, leaving economies with debt overhand and weak institutions finding it difficult to attract capital. Bringing down debt levels, improving regulations, and increasing regulatory certainty will be critical. There would also be a premium for proven cash generating assets, 
all these factors will be accentuated after the pandemic. This leads to our fourth trend, which is the exploration of asset recycling and a privatization by cash-strapped governments to close the gap. Low interest rates and the exit of some private financiers will also create openings for new operators interested in improving asset performance. The role of an MDB like AIB is to uncover new financing and risk sharing models to entice more private sector organizations to enter the sector in emerging markets. This is why we are aiming at 50% of AIB's approved financing to be in the private sector by 2030. The fifth train represents a mixed view for trade and supply chains. We believe in globalization and its broad benefits for all parties involved. The issue of ultra-nationalism and the retreat from international trade we have witnessed in recent years will continue in the near term. However, the trend is not strictly dictated by irrational thinking or unconventional policies. Rather, the economy will relentlessly follow its own course. As the Chinese saying goes, those who follow the trend will prosper, whereas those who resist it will perish. Opportunities abound for investments in connectivity and cross-border investment infrastructure. New infrastructure development boosted by new technology will bring forth immediate benefits and pay off in the longer term. Global trade will eventually open up and those countries who invest smartly will be ready to capitalize on those opportunities. Five years ago, we started, to, uh, we started a bank that was to be part of the gene pool of the MDB's family, but one with new features. Five years on, our efforts continue, but the ambition has grown. I should highlight that we at AIB have been doing what was not expected just a year ago, providing massive budget support and a policy lending to our client members in their efforts to bring the pandemic under control and to save lives. This has been our priority over the course of 2020. And we have leveraged our systems to ensure timely delivery while we will continue to address the needs of our members and clients during this evolving situation we have also increased our efforts in preparing for our mainstream business post COVID-19. But AIB's investments must also evolve. We should not copy what has already been done. We will chart a new path we call the infrastructure for tomorrow. This is green infrastructure with sustainability, innovation, and connectivity all intricately intertwined at its core. This is our new mission. By investing in infrastructure for tomorrow, we will unlock new capital, new technologies, and new ways in which we address climate change and connect Asia internally and with the rest of the world. AIB is a learning institution. We will not cease to pick up new technology, new expertise, or to explore new approaches to development financing. At this point, I'm happy to take questions to clarify any of the points I've just shared with you. Thank you very much. Well, Mr. President, thank you for those uh, terrific remarks. Uh, you've given us great insight uh, into the organization, uh, the five principles that you have related uh, with respect to its uh, vision. Uh, and, but you've also given us insight into your own leadership uh, qualities and your own leadership style. Uh, and we have great respect for that. What I'd like to do is to ask a series of questions, if we could, that will probe more deeply into the subjects that you have raised. And if I may, let me start with the first one. And it, it talks, a, it, it asks a bit about the, the journey that you have been on. Now, AIIB is five years old, as you have said. But what was the original impetus uh, for establishing the AIIB at the time? Uh, there were a lot of international financial institutions, and China had just established uh, the New Development Bank. 
so as we say, what was the value proposition of a, a different entity, a new entity, the AIIB at the beginning? Why the AIIB, sir? Thank you very much. I think this question uh, was addressed uh, to me quite a number of times, particularly early in the stage. And uh, five years on, it seems that a uh, few people uh, would question the validity, uh, the raison d'etre of having new institution. But the point uh, uh, was that uh, probably we need a new multilateral development institution. It's regional in its focus but it's global or international in its coverage. Uh, as you see, I worked in the World Bank. I worked in uh, ADB, both on the board and in the management team. Um, I think uh, it's uh, wonderful to see the Bretton Woods institutions and all those regional development banks which pattern on the Bretton Woods institutions uh, have done over the last uh, seven decades, half a century, they helped with infrastructure development, deal, dealing with a lot of challenges faced by the international community. But over the last three or four decades, the World Bank and ADB seem to focus very much on social sector, poverty reduction, which is vitally important, but that will leave these banks with less capital to be invested in infrastructure. So we in Asia uh, talked about this. We, we discussed the issue of the engine or the driver for sustained growth. We believe Asia has a deficit of infrastructure. So let's create a bank which will focus very much on infrastructure and other productive sectors. So as you see, we do not take poverty reduction as the overriding mission. We focus on infrastructure, which we believe would pave the path for sustained development. But of course, it took some time for people to come to uh, uh, come, you know, to achieve a consensus. But I am very happy to see that over the last five years, we have tried with what we did to convince a lot of people. Well, sir, you, uh, you addressed in your remarks on several points uh, the, the issue of climate. Um, and it's been attributed to you that you, that you have used and many people have uh, echoed the idea of being lean, clean, and green. Um, there was a concern, though, in the U.S., and, and this, again, this session is to help to educate the U.S. and a global audience on the uh, origins of the AIB and its, its, its value proposition today, which is significant. But there was a concern when the AIIB was first established that environmental standards would not be uh, as strictly uh, central mm -hmm. to your vision uh, as you have talked about in just a moment ago. Now, five years on, uh, how do you respond to those early critics about how AIIB would view climate and the business of being green? As you know, I worked in the Chinese government for three decades and uh, before I started to take over this job of setting up this new bank. And I, I knew when Chinese leaders would like to create a bank which would be uh, catering to the needs of developing countries in the 21st century, the overriding concern is whether the world at large would accept it as a multilateral development bank in every sense of the word. Multilateral means you must have more, more countries to join these efforts in building this bank, not you doing this alone, right? But how can you mobilize the broad uh, masses of the people to support this? How can you bring so many countries to join? The question is very simple. The answer is very simple, standards. Only when you have very high standards could you hope to bring number of countries, particularly countries in the, uh, in the West, to join and to work with you. I visited the White House twice, a uh, um, couple of times in the State Department and Treasury, uh, where I have lots of friends. I clarified a lot of issues. Why this bank is going to be 
created and why we welcome the United States to join. And uh, I addressed a lot of concerns such as safeguards, social, environmental, social standards. In today's world, if you do something, investment, without the environment, I don't think uh, people can support you. And particularly for the multilateral development bank, financing or resources may not be the big issue. I think the biggest challenge is whether you will be embraced by your clients, whether people think you'll be doing the right thing rather than doing the damage to the economy or their lives. So I think even the United States uh, finally decided not to join, which I respect, but we are, we understand each other. I think we, we enhance the mutual understanding. That's why you see over the last five years, we have really had very, very good relationship with American financial institutions and the business companies and also think tanks. So for instance, I, I uh, addressed the Brookings in a couple of times and um, uh, I think uh, I, I really enjoy this kind of a dialogue and a conversation. As you know, Bank New York Mellon is our dollar clearing bank, clearing bank, and we have asset managers uh, such as the Goldman Sachs, um, BlackRock, and we have uh, American uh, financial institutions to serve as the uh, lead agencies for our lead underwriters for our global dollar bonds. I, I really appreciate the support from your regulatory bodies that we can bring, uh, I think, uh, uh, our presence to the uh, global dollar market. Uh, give the American investors an opportunity to invest in, in our assets. So all this means, regardless of the membership, AIB and the United States can work together. We can work with American people. We can work with American businesses. As you know, we have very senior people, Americans, working in our institution. I, and I have an American national in my office. I, I often say, see, we have an American in the nerve center of this bank. It takes time for people to understand, you know? It, it does. And performance in the end is, uh, is what speaks the loudest, not just words, but performance. And that, of course, I think is undeniable over the last five years of your first term. Um, and of course, Brookings is, is very keen to have these conversations. And I think, mm -hmm. as you well know, one of our distinguished fellows uh, has just departed Brookings to be the Secretary of the Treasury, Janet Yellen. Yes. So we're yes. very excited about that, that potential. And of course, this lays the groundwork with new American leadership as of Wednesday uh, for the conversation about the United States and Asia, the United States and the AIIB. Now, one of the things that we've we've talked about now this morning a couple of times uh, is uh, the issue of climate. And as you are aware, one of the very first things that Joe Biden did in the aftermath of his inaugural address on Wednesday was to sign an executive order which returns the United States to the Paris Climate Accord. Uh, how do you anticipate AIIB's role specifically in helping to fight climate change? And, and how do you think that will evolve over time? You've been involved in that, the, the clean, green uh, approach with respect to um, investment strategies. But how do you anticipate the, the coming years and the specific role of the bank in helping to, to fight climate change? And now potentially as a partner with the United States, since we rejoined the Paris Climate Accord. Thank you. I, I had the honor and the privilege to meet uh, uh, President Joe Biden when he was vice president. And we had a very good discussions when I was part of the team for the track two dialogues on political uh, issues. And uh, uh, certainly it's very much gratifying to see uh, the President Biden signed into the executive uh, decree that uh, US would come back to uh, Paris Agreement, which is really very much encouraging, very much uh, welcome. Now, as you said, uh, our, uh, as you know, our core value is lean, clean, green. Uh, lean means we will remain uh, very uh, effective without building up uh, a bureaucracy. As I said, we would prevent institutional obesity. So we will remain lean. Uh, 
And remaining lean is very important for us to save each and every penny, uh, which is a taxpayer's money. Uh, clean, we want to be squeaky clean. We do not tolerate corruption. Zero tolerance corruption is our hallmark of the culture of our institution. And last but not least, green, green economy. Uh, of course, uh, we understand uh, it's a challenge to help those countries move away from fossil fuel. But you see, the damage done by climate change has been more evident over the recent years. Now, people are worried over the, uh, the melting of the uh, Arctic, Antarctic, you know, ice and the sea levels going up to to submerge you know, some you know island countries and the drastic uh, climate, weather, all these kind of things created the problems. Now the the outbreak of pandemic has alerted us to yet another big risk, because I do believe there is kind of relationship between environmental degradation ecosystem uh, debalancing and, and uh, these virus and bacteria. You, you know, the environmental degradation would be the breeding ground for viruses, for bacteria, for all kinds of disease. So we all understand now that it's really very urgent. It's the burning issue for all of us to deal with climate change, but it's not something which any single country can handle single-handedly. It calls for the international cooperation. And of course, it calls for investments in renewable energy, investments which can help all of us moving away from carbon as soon as possible. So this is urgent. As a multilateral development bank created in the 21st century, this is really what we have to do. Well, I think your point is uh, extremely important, President Jin, about the, the inextricable linkage uh, between decarbonization, smart investment strategies in that regard. Uh, but as you say, one of the realities of the pandemic is it has exposed real vulnerabilities that are in our future. Uh, as we begin to see um, ecological degradation. Uh, and as we see the climate warming, uh, as we see the spread of traditionally tropic diseases potentially uh, into the more Northern latitudes, this is a real challenge. And in many respects, that challenge can be met uh, with smart infrastructure investment. Um, but specifically to COVID, uh, as you have mentioned it, how has that, uh, the disease itself and reacting to the pandemic, how has that impacted uh, the operation of your organization? Uh, and in how has that impacted your capacity to think uh, strategically mm -hmm. over the mm -hmm. long term? And also your partners, how are they doing uh, during this moment of, uh, of real economic stress because of the pandemic? After the outbreak of the pandemic, the first thing we do was to uh, provided support to all those client members which need our help. So we uh, have to uh, reduce our lending for the mainstream business, the traditional, traditionally defined infrastructure, and we allocate resources, uh, $13 billion to deal with the COVID-19. We provide budget support and policy lending in cooperation with the World Bank and ADB because they have experience in this regard. And uh, uh, I think uh, this response uh, is important, which means the, the new bank is agile, adaptable, and uh, can respond to the urgent needs of this country. But uh, I make it very much clear, once the pandemic is brought under control, we will go back to the mainstream business of infrastructure investment. However, pandemic has also alerted us to the risks of neglect of investment in healthcare. So in the future, we would take 
healthcare as part of our uh, mm. uh, efforts. But uh, we will strike a proper balance between uh, traditional infrastructure projects and healthcare. And by the way, we also believe uh, digital infrastructure is very much important. And we actually take advantage of digital, digital technology to go on with the businesses. We work from home and we continue to propel projects uh, by uh, connecting with our uh, project sponsors, host governments, by going online, having virtual meetings. Uh, indeed, we never ceased to have this kind of uh, meetings, interactions throughout the whole year. That is why we managed to, to uh, carry on the investment which is uh, needed. Of course, I would say uh, all of these development banks would face some challenges moving on because uh, we really disrupted. Uh, we see the disruption in our normal preparation of the uh, projects. But I think we can pick up the momentum later on and through uh, digital technology. So the pandemic certainly is something very bad, but it's also, uh, I think, uh, help us to, to see some of things which we, we probably could not see otherwise. How could we try to interact with each other when social distancing is required? How can we go on with the work when we could not travel, when international travel is banned? And throughout this whole process, I would, uh, I would say that we really appreciate the support from our client uh, members and also uh, the uh, shareholders who give us huge support and who supported our adjustment of the lending program. So uh, I, I, I think you know, 2020 uh, was a tough year, but it also uh, helps understand there are really so many beautiful minds. Well, uh, you, you have truly described the complexity of 2020. You know, dealing with the disease, uh, dealing with the, <clears throat> the national reflex to turn inwards for many countries to try to deal with the disease. Uh, but as you say, there is a direct relationship uh, between dealing with the disease and having a long-term vision and a strategy for infrastructure development. And doing all of that in an environment where we couldn't be together, we had to do it uh, digitally over long distances, uh, has been a complexity that uh, very clearly you have embraced. Uh, and it has, in fact, I think, uh, in many respects, accelerated uh, the value of AIIB uh, in helping to climb out of this COVID difficulty that we face today. Uh, let me ask the, the I think an important question. And what is what has been the relationship of the AIIB with the Asian Development Bank uh, in cooperation during the pandemic? Uh, we, uh, from the very beginning, uh, started a very good, productive, cooperative relationship with the World Bank and ADB. At that time, early early in the days, there were really concerns and skepticism whether this new bank would undercut the World Bank, would undercut uh, ADB. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think I'm fortunate enough to have so many friends in the World Bank and in ADB. I worked in both institutions. So I tried by every means to clarify our mission and our sincerity to work in close collaboration with these two institutions. ADB is in Asia. ADB has also a big mandate to help low-income countries to reduce the poverty uh, with the concessional funding. As you know, we don't have concessional funding. Uh, so we cooperate and uh, we understand uh, it, it's really wonderful for, for us to work together because when we work together, we can reduce costs. Hmm. Okay, we can be more efficient and uh, uh, also to a certain extent, we can uh, help the World Bank and ADB to continue to lend to a country, even when they approach the country limit. When the, any institution reach, reaches its country limit to a certain country, it will have to probably reduce the lending and to stop, uh, thereby probably would be losing the opportunity of having effective dialogues with the government. So my idea is that uh, 
you can reduce your lending and we chip in. We help make up for the uh, shortage of the resources mm -hmm. from your institution. And I told the World Bank, uh, I told a former World Bank head, Jim King, and also uh, David Malpass. I said, you know, World Bank uh, is a well-established institution with more than seven decades of experience. We are very happy to work with you. You maintain your influence in the borrowing countries with whatever amount of money we chip in. I said, you remain the conductor. I just want to have a seat in orchestra playing my flute or or clarinet, whatever. Give me a seat in orchestra and you go on conducting. And this is wonderful cooperation, right? And it's worked over the last five years. So now the pandemic also gave us an opportunity of working together because ADB and the World Bank have macroeconomists. They have country program. We don't. We focus very much on the specific sector. So the Bonomi question, our ability to finance policy lending, budget support. But when we tell our, tell, told our board, we work with the World Bank ADB. No questions asked. It's wonderful. Well, well, the, the visual of the orchestra is excellent. Um, you, you join the harmony uh, of the orchestra rather than uh, create cacophony. It's a complementary role as opposed right. to a competitive role. And that's important to understand as we go forward. You know, sir, uh, uh, President Biden has been very clear, uh, and you can see it in the testimony of his nominees who are right now going through the confirmation process, that there is a desire for the United States in this administration to re-embrace a commitment to multilateralism uh, and also to uh, continue the process of deepening and strengthening traditional relationships that we've had uh, around the world, and in particular in Asia. Uh, and, and this, of course, will play out with our relationship with Japan. And of course, neither Japan nor the United States are part of the AIIB. But as you listen uh, to the new administration and with your long experience with the United States in the past, as you say, you have Americans uh, throughout the bank. Uh, what do you think of or what does it mean to you when you hear the United States being recommitted to multilateralism in the world? That's certainly great news. And I think uh, U.S. as the biggest economy uh, can contribute substantially to the international cooperation. U.S. can play a leading role in a number of areas. So we are looking forward to be uh, working with the United States in the multilateral institutions. As I said, regardless of the membership of U.S. in this bank, we have ample space to work together. And over the last five years, we have a wonderful relationship and it's of mutual benefit uh, to us, the AIIB, and also to the U.S. Uh, financial institutions, business companies. So this will go on, no question about that. And uh, I, I think uh, President Biden's uh, decision to uh, go back to Paris Agreement and to focus on climate change mitigation will also create uh, the common ground uh, to work with China. You know, these two biggest economies uh, should work together to reduce uh, the, to, to deal with the challenges faced by the human beings, right? And I think a dialogue uh, would be very much helpful. As you know, early uh, from the 1980s, I was always involved in US-China dialogue. Uh, we call the US-China Joint Economic Committee, and later on it's SED. And, uh, and then when I uh, left the Chinese government, uh, there was a moratorium for my, my dialogue with an American colleagues, even though I, I, did, I continued my contact with American officials or business people. Uh, but as that's, that's for my business with ADB. But after I Retired from ADB 208, I was invited to join the team of the Track 2 Dialogue with Henry Kissinger uh, as chairman of the US team, as uh, the former uh, foreign minister and state counselor Tang Xiaoxuan as the Chinese team's uh, chairman. So I, I had uh, uh, very good conversations. I was in another Track 2 Dialogue, which was on businesses. 
with uh, former Vice Premier Chen Peiyan and McDonald of U.S. Chamber of Commerce. So, so these two track dialogue, one on political issues, the other on business and trade, is very good. I had opportunity to continue my engagement uh, with my American friends, businesses, officials, and that gave me the opportunity of a dialogue, uh, which means we should talk to each other. There might be differences, right? But let's talk to each other. And I think China and the United States, uh, if they can talk to each other, see common ground, work together to deal with the challenges facing the human beings, facing the mankind, that will be really appreciated by the rest of the world. And I, I really wish this new administration all the best. And as a Chinese national, I certainly would like to see US-China relationship would improve. And as an international civil servant, I would look forward to the continued cooperation between AIB and uh, US businesses and, and the uh, people of all walks of life. Well, that's very inspiring, sir. Um, and, and as you may have heard at Brookings, we describe the US-China relationship as the consequential relationship of the 21st century. And I, I don't think it's uh, even disputable. Uh, but we find once again, at the end of the previous administration, at the beginning of a new administration with a very different world outlook, that the US and China relationships is, relationship is once again at a crossroad. From your long experience, and you've given us some of this already today in the conversation, from your long experience <coughs> in international organizations, uh, and now in the AIIB, what advice can you give both China and the United States at this crossroads, at this critical moment where we face so many similar challenges for how we can be fellow travelers in this journey rather than intense competitors? I, I would remain humble and refrain from giving advice to both the governments, <laughs> but I may uh, share with you my observation. And uh, starting from 1980, when I uh, moved to Washington DC, worked in the World Bank, I started to learn about your country, your history, your people. And prior to that, I learned, learned about America only by reading books. And 1980, gave me the chance to be physically in the United States and making friends with American people. So this was a very important period of my life. And I went back to, to the US uh, in the late 1980s and uh, early 1990s. But of course, I travel the US every year. So I would say, um, given my uh, knowledge about your country and your people, I would say there are many, many people in your country who have vision, who have far sight, who understand what are the most important things for the United States to pursue. Okay. And uh, throughout your history, your history, American history, there were some kind of you know, difficult times, but American people managed to work them out. And uh, I recently uh, read uh, the book from cover to cover uh, about Ulysses Grant and by Ron Chernow. Ron Chernow yep. is a friend of mine. And uh, I also uh, uh, read some other books about uh, your political leaders, uh, Hamilton, George Washington. And, and uh, I, I find you are not lacking in talents, in people with vision. So if there were some Difficult times, I do believe you will get over them. In China, uh, the, as you see, China has always taken the foreign policy with, related, re, with regard to the United States as the most important foreign policy. And given my personal experience in the Chinese Ministry of Finance, dealing with the United States on financial issues, but I do know that Chinese leaders and Chinese uh, political leaders think tankers, academics, all regard the United States as a very important partner. So I think on both sides, there, there is goodwill to carry on the 
uh, amicable relationship, which is, is so important for these two the people, two peoples of our countries. As you know, I have very good personal relationship with Dr. Henry Kissinger. And I remember what he said almost verbatim. This is, this is what he said more than 30 years ago. He said, whatever may happen in the future, I believe the American people's friendliness towards the Chinese people will not change. And I, as you know, I, I know, for instance, the senior Bush, I was in his office, early 1980s. I still keep the, uh, keep the very good photo with him and uh, uh, President Bush also, and uh, some of uh, your political leaders. And each time I have a chance to meet them, I think uh, they all believe that this is a very much important issue, how two nations can work them out. So let me tell you, I remain optimistic. I don't think we should be held back because of the, because some of the difficulties, some of the hurdles, or mistrust, right? So we should understand that misunderstanding is inevitable, but we should also understand, understand misunderstanding can be dispelled. And this is my deep conviction. And I wish these two countries all the best under the new administration of the United States. Well, thank you for that uh, very optimistic and I think uplifting uh, response. If you look behind me, you'll, you'll see something that is important to my own family. And it, I think it really makes the case that you have made. And that is uh, that the relationship between the Chinese people and the American people is a very strong relationship. And it'll be upon the foundation of the people to people uh, affection and the people to people relationship that we can solve those issues where we can overcome the trust deficit we can find a way forward together as fellow travelers as i said in the 21st century and not uh, intense competitors because no one benefits from that and there's yes, you know so um, yeah, yeah yeah you know when i saw uh, some of the difficult times you have experienced recently and then i i i pick up you know ulysses grant and i saw that at that time, the United States was deeply divided. Yes. But still, the American people could you know, solve the problem and be reunited. And uh, I think uh, American people should be proud of their experience of healing the wounds of war and uh, bring all the different part of the people, um, the different sections of the society together. I think, I think you have great people. And I believe Chinese uh, nation is a great nation. So. Let's let's work together. But I, I'm I'm talking to you as a Chinese national. I'm sorry. I should talk about uh, all these issues from the international perspective. But I see I cannot help it because I'm a Chinese. That's right. And there's no reason why we can't have this conversation at the same time we're <laughs> talking about the geopolitical challenges that we face. Uh, Mr. President, let me ask you one final question. Um, a, a a quote foreign policy for the middle class unquote, is a phrase that you're hearing in this new administration. Mm -hmm. It's used by the Biden administration to describe not just uh, a foreign policy uh, for America's future, but a foreign policy that is relevant to our own middle class. And you've just said, we're experiencing some real challenges now between the disease and the economic downturn, uh, a national reckoning on race, which is still an issue unresolved from the end of our civil war, as you have said. Uh, in your readings about General Grant and President Grant. As we go forward in the future, how is the AIIB thinking about infrastructure development in the context of the surging global middle class? As you say, it's, it's a matter of helping people in improving the lot of humankind. Uh, and we have seen up to the moment of the pandemic, a real surge in the global middle class how is the AIIB going to be a player over the long term with your strategic vision and leadership in furthering uh, the interests of the global middle class? Uh, you see, to create wealth for our client members is important. And uh, we emphasize the point that creating wealth, which would be uh, fairly evenly distributed. But for many countries, I, I would say it's certainly a challenge because many low income
income countries have a last, uh, vast number of people who still probably are below poverty line. In developed countries, the middle-income countries, I think the challenge is to, to uh, help the middle-income uh, section of the society and to continue to improve their livelihood because the middle class is a stabilizing force of any society. When you have a large middle class, in middle income class, the society will be stable. And uh, if that's uh, upended, uh, you definitely will not be surprised when you see social unrest. So as any society moves forward to middle income level, high income level, I think the crucial issue is to build up the middle income class. But that depends very much on sustained growth. The middle income class could look very strong, robust, but they are almost very vulnerable because if any financial or economic crisis hits the country, they are likely to lose jobs. Right. They are likely to lose jobs. So I think they are very much vulnerable. And there's another risk we should take care of, which is the impact of digital AI technology. They will take away a lot of traditional jobs, which are the domain of the middle income class. I'm not saying new jobs will not be created. Yes, they will. But how can we help these people, particularly younger generation, to have decent jobs, to maintain a decent livelihood? That is the responsibility, certainly, of the government, but also that's the responsibility of, of all of the investors who invest for the future. Mm. So when we say we invest for, for tomorrow, infrastructure for tomorrow, we think about the mission of paving the path for large number of people to move upwards towards the middle income level. In the United States, if you have a strong middle class, middle income class, if they have secure jobs, your society is always free of troubles. And, and this is true of the Western European countries, right? So China and um, some other countries like Brazil, Mexico, and I'm moving towards the middle income level. And they also have to take care of this, how to make sure the middle income group of people will have a secure livelihood. So far as our bank is concerned, uh, we, as you know, we do not take a poverty reduction as an overarching objective, mm -hmm. but we try to deal with poverty reduction through our investment in infrastructure, increase, increase the social wealth uh, for the society as a whole. As we often said, a rising tide lifting all the boats. So this is what we do. Um, I... I, I think you know also know that we invest not only in low income countries, but we also invest in higher income countries, middle income countries. Now, this is very much important because as a financial institution, we have to make sure we stand on firm ground. We should have very sound financial foundation. How could we do that? By investing in middle income countries, making sure our return is safe and reasonably high. Thereby, we are capable of providing support to low-income countries. And we can take higher risks when we support those low-income countries. That's why we have a balanced approach to develop our financing programs for low-income countries, but also we support middle-income countries. I think this is very much important, you know. There's no question that it is. And, and getting back to uh, President Biden's intent for a foreign policy uh, for the middle class, uh, if the American middle class senses that our international relations, as you say, creates a rising tide, it's not just good for our society, it strengthens our commitment to international relations and multilateralism, uh, which of course uh, is uh, very much uh, complementary to the vision of the AIIB. Well, sir, it's been wonderful to, to talk with you uh, this morning. Uh, I think we're all better educated uh, as a result of, of your explanation of the work of the AIIB. But I think we're also uh, very optimistic 
uh, about the future of that organization uh, to contribute to the well-being of humanity. Uh, we at Brookings are very proud uh, of uh, the work that we do on China. Uh, we believe ourselves to be a platform for respectful, civil conversations over this matter. It's been difficult over the last several years, but we believe that we are a platform and, and we can have the difficult conversations uh, with China uh, and the United States on a Brookings platform going forward because we have to have those conversations. Mm -hmm. And in particular, the issues of the global economy, dealing with the global pandemic and how together we can find our way uh, for the betterment of humankind uh, rather than to be competitors in that regard. And one of the things that you said, sir, several times, we didn't get the chance really to uh, explore it the way I would have liked. And that's the issue of the digital future. Uh, and the role of artificial intelligence, uh, as it will affect not just the future of work, but the future of workers. Uh, and so with that, today you and I are looking at each other across thousands of miles uh, on a computer. Uh, we hope soon for the end of the pandemic so that you can join us in Washington, uh, in person, at the Brookings Institution, where we can have a strong conversation uh, about the future of technology and the future of the the digital investments that need to be made for the better of both of our people, but also the betterment of humanity. Thank you for your leadership. Uh, thank you for bringing the AIIB to our audience today. Uh, and we wish you the best, sir. And if you have any closing thoughts, uh, we'd be very grateful to hear them. Thank you. Thank you, President Allen. I will give you the standing invitation to visit our new headquarters in Beijing. Uh, once the pandemic is uh, behind us, I really would like you to, to see you here. And, and definitely, I would uh, uh, be very happy to visit uh, Brookings again. I have read so many books published by the institution, and I learned so much from so many talented you know, uh, scholars in your institution. As you said, Brookings is such an international uh, institution, enjoy international reputation. And your books, your thoughts, have inspired so many people. And I wish you all the best. And I think you will be the, uh, the source of inspiration and new ideas to so many people across the world. I really uh, feel very much privileged to have an association with you and your institution. Thank you very much. I thank also you. like to thank everybody who attends this dialogue. Thank you, sir. Please stay well and healthy, and we'll thank see you, you soon. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. You have a nice day. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.